singing is a wonderful thing. Anybody can do it. Even me, and in fact, you're going to be hearing me sing quite a bit, unfortunately for you. La donna è mobile, qual piuma al vento, muta da cento e di pensiero. <laughs> Opera is a passionate and thrilling entertainment. And within 200 years of its birth in Italy, it was so popular that even delivery boys were singing its catchy tunes. In the 19th century, opera in Italy is firing on all cylinders. Rossini is at the height of his powers. Donizetti and Bellini are writing stirring romantic operas. Into this august company is born a genius who will take opera to its zenith. Yes, Giuseppe Verdi. Verdi's operas are the backbone of the international opera scene and central to my repertoire as a conductor. Here at the Royal Opera House in London, where I'm music director, we're rehearsing one of his great masterpieces, La Traviata. Verdi was a consummate man of the theater. He knew just how to construct a great show. Verdi to me is quintessentially Italian opera. This is, this is the real ragu sauce with pasta. If the human soul was a harp, and every string of the harp represented a, a human emotion. Verdi was plucking the right string at the right time for the right emotion. Passionate. I mean, that's what it is. It's passion. Where did this passionate music come from? Verdi was born in the fertile plains of Emilia Romagna in northern Italy in 1813. While the physical landscape was peaceful enough, the political situation was not. Italy was under French Napoleonic control, but that rule was being challenged in the north by the Austrians and the Russians. I'm in the village of Le Roncole, where Giuseppe Verdi was born. Very little is known about Giuseppe's infancy, but the story goes that Russian troops, rooting out French sympathizers, smashed their way into this church. We're in the rectory here. They found women and children in the church, through there. They slaughtered them. But Luigia, Giuseppe's mother, brought her child through here and hid the little baby Peppino in the bell tower and saved his life. A miracle, a very operatic beginning. And the turbulent political environment would have a big influence on Verdi's art. His musical training began in this very church. As a boy, Verdi was obsessed by music. He studied with the village organist, and by the age of nine, had the job himself. He played on this very instrument. When he was a teenager, his parents sent him to study with the organist in nearby Busseto. Here he was noticed by the rich local merchant and music lover, Antonio Barezzi, who soon became his sponsor. Now, Barezzi had six children of his own, but he invited Verdi into his house to stay and encouraged him to compose all sorts of music for soirees and concerts in his sophisticated salon. And while he was here, Verdi fell in love with Barezzi's daughter, 
Margherita, and eventually married her. When he was 18, Verdi applied to the celebrated Milan Conservatory, but he was rejected. Perhaps because he had an unorthodox piano technique. Whatever the reason, it was an enormous shock, and it may well help explain why his operas have such sympathy for outsiders and the oppressed. Ironically, that same conservatory now bears Verdi's name. Despite the fact that he didn't get into the conservatory, Verdi stayed in Milan and Barizzi paid for him to study privately. He even funded frequent trips to the opera, which at the time was dominated by Rossini, Bellini and Donizetti. These operas were in the bel canto style. Bel canto, literally beautiful singing. And one of the new hits which Verdi certainly would have seen was Donizetti's Lucia di Lamemore. The mad scene in particular caused a sensation. Here it is sung by the great soprano Joan Sutherland. Lucia has gone insane and is hallucinating after stabbing her husband to death on their wedding night. This is high romanticism, all the rage in art and literature in the early 19th century. With its extreme emotions and melodramatic stories, it transformed Italian opera too. Donizetti took the novel The Bride of Lammermoor with its mysterious Scottish setting by Sir Walter Scott and turned it into an opera that would epitomize the new Italian romantic style. This idea of romanticism was obviously enormously important for Donizetti. He once wrote to a librettist, a librettist was asking, well, what kind of topic do you want? And he said, voglio amore e amore violento. I want love, violent love. It's not a great pickup line, but it worked very well for Italian opera at that period. And the women, the heroines, are usually reduced to their most impassioned and desperate state. <laughs> Lucia's famous mad scene is the climax of the opera, an incredible 15-minute display of vocal pyrotechnics. <laughs> to understand how Donizetti used the voice to dramatize Lucia's insanity, I'm going to work on it with the great bel canto singer Diana Damrau. Donizetti used the eerie-sounding glass harmonica to heighten the gothic atmosphere. Because it's an extreme situation, um, you can use extreme methods of singing, colors, um, dramatic outbursts. Um, you, you must really play with all the skills you have. She's in staccato notes, detached notes. She sees the blood on her dress. It's really bipolar. You can, you can see she, she switches completely into a different mood and suddenly, out of, out of nothing. Lucia, with its extreme emotions and primary color passions, was an opera that would certainly influence the young Giuseppe Verdi. The orchestra rejoins now. Oh. 
Verdi's first big hit, Nabucco, features a dramatic heroine, Abigail, who, like Lucia, plums the heights and depths of emotional extravagance. But Verdi intensifies the vocal display to underpin the dramatic situation. Nabucco tells the biblical story of the Jews in exile in Babylon, and it had powerful resonances for Italians at the time. After Napoleon's armies had been ousted, the Italian peninsula had returned to its fragmented state and was under the control of foreign powers. Verdi's contemporaries were quick to see the parallels between the exiled Jews in Nabucco and the plight of the Italian people. I'm just about to conduct a concert here in Naples, a concert of Verdi's music. Perhaps the most important piece on the program is the Va Pensiero chorus, the chorus of the Hebrew slaves from Nabucco. We're going to have 9,000 to 10,000 people here watching it, and I think it means something very, very special, even today, to the Italian people. It's a feeling of identity and of history, and of culture, and nostalgia for an incredible past. This concert was broadcast live on Italian television to an audience of nearly two million. In Nabucco, Verdi found his true voice. gestures are huge. Calling for the audience's attention. But also now, Verdi in this opera makes the chorus a protagonist. And this is a very important development in the history of Italian opera, that it's not just the star singers, but it's the chorus, the people who have a voice. praying for their freedom, for their release, on golden wings. Quite an innovation for the time, because the chorus is not singing in harmony, they're singing in unison, singing the same notes. They talk about the Jordan, le rive salute, their prayers to greet um, the river Jordan, their Zion's destroyed temples. Oh, my country, so beautiful and lost. that they break out into harmony. This made Verdi one of the most important figures of the day because he expressed Italian pride, Italian nationalism, and brought the country together. In its very first year, Nabucco broke all box office records at La Scala. And Verdi's bankability led the two leading publishers of the day to fight over the rights to his work. Counterfeit sheet music was easy to make and very, very difficult to suppress, and it was everywhere. Now, for a composer like Giuseppe Verdi, and especially one as prolific as he was, it was of paramount importance to find a publisher who would take care of your music, print it, distribute it 
and most importantly, make sure you got paid every time somebody wanted that music. The man who won the right to publish Nabucco was Giovanni Ricordi, who had a booming publishing empire. His relationship with Verdi wasn't simply financial. Giovanni and his descendants became his mentors and collaborators. Verdi's private life was as full of drama as any operatic plot. He and Margherita had two children together. But tragically, they both died in their infancy and were followed soon after by their mother. Verdi was left a widower at age 26. Despite his personal trauma, he threw himself into work. The 1840s for Verdi were what he called his galley years, during which, like a slave chained to his oar, he poured out operas, some successful, some not. By the time he wrote Rigoletto in 1851, he'd reached a new creative maturity and significantly, the central character, like Verdi himself, was a widower. But getting Rigoletto to the stage was a drama in itself. Verdi was plagued by the censors who didn't like his choice of subject. It was based on a band play about depravity at the court of the French king and was going to premiere at La Fenice in Venice. Venice had a reputation, of course, in the past of being, shall we say, more morally relaxed. But listen to this from the Department of Public Order. The department deplores the fact that the poet Piave and the great Maestro Verdi have not been able to find any scope for their talents other than the disgusting immorality and obscene triviality of the plot titled La Maledizione, The Curse. This was Rigoletto's working title at the time. His ex Excellency has decided to refuse absolutely the request for its performance. The, the idea of Rigoletto was compromised also by the fact that it was based on a play by Victor Hugo, who was known as a Republican and therefore a dangerous character to start with. Uh, and his idea of having the King of France being this kind of libertine, you know, immoral, trivial character was, was simply impossible as far as the censors are concerned. In the end, they came to a compromise, called him the Duke of Mantua. Apparently, you could do anything in Mantua. It didn't really matter. And the licentious duke, the villain of the piece, was written for the tenor voice, another controversial move, because until now, audiences expected the tenor to be the hero. He's turning convention on its head. The tenor is not the hero of the piece. The hero is the baritone. But he's a dark hero. Rigoletto is a court jester who is physically deformed, a hunchback, an indication for audiences of the time that he must somehow be evil. We have to put our mind in that period. Is early 19th century, is almost 200 years ago. And it's not easy for anyone to, to write an opera like Rigoletto in that period. This is a revolution change of the structure of the opera. Rigolet is a heroic figure who is warped and poisoned by the world he lives in. And that world is exemplified by the handsome young Duke, who is utterly rotten to his soul. Yeah. 
The music he sings may be attractive, light, careless, but that's because Verdi's painting a very good portrait of an utterly shallow man. Verdi created one of his most catchy tunes for the Duke, and soon after the premiere, people were singing it in the streets. It's in complete contrast to the dark music he wrote for Rigoletto. Now, we meet Rigoletto in Act One, a caustic fellow making fun of everybody, mocking everyone, but he goes one step too far. He mocks Monterone, whose daughter has been seduced by the Duke, and Monterone puts a curse on him. Now, curse in opera is a very, very important device, and this curse will stay with Rigoletto. He goes home very troubled. Now, the composers before him, Bellini, Donizetti, and Rossini, did write very declamatory recitatives, but not to the same de degree of intensity that Verdi now brings this. He even introduces what later became called a leitmotif, um, an obsessional visiting card, musical visiting card, that old man cursed me. And we will hear this theme over and over again in the opera. Quel vecchio male di Just one note that bores into him. The restative now has become an enormous expression of his humanity, of his foibles, of, of his worries, of, of his entire psychology. And this is what Verdi has brought forward now in the world of opera, deeper complexity, a much more theatrical pouring out of emotions, of expressions that will touch the audience. <laughs> Unknown to anyone else, the widower Rigoletto has a daughter who he has kept hidden from the court. He's writing about a father-daughter relationship in depth, and this is, of course, going to become one of his obsessive, obsessive themes in the later operas, and something which he always depicted so successfully, because he always felt the loss of his own daughter. And now the curse put on Rigoletto is played out. His beloved daughter is abducted and seduced by the Duke. Rigoletto, feeling betrayed, the, the orchestra, again, conjures up an energy. <laughs> He's saying, you courtiers, you evil race, you accursed race. It's the moment where Rigoletto's mask finally drops, where he actually turns on the courtiers as, as an equal and really tells them what he thinks of them. He just lets rip. And uh, Verdi does this to a pumping, muscular vocal line. The baritone is nearly shouting. You have to have a great deal of force to get through this number.
opera is becoming something that now we recognize as being the most heightened expression of that which is in these, yes, deformed characters, these depraved characters, these flawed people, but they're characters that hold our interest. We want to know what is going to happen. By the time he wrote Rigoletto, Verdi had found love again with Giuseppina Strepponi, a soprano who'd starred in Nabucco. She was to devote the rest of her life to him, but she had tarnished her reputation with past affairs and illegitimate children. And when they came back to Buceto to live in the palazzo Verdi had bought, she was ostracized. People started spitting at uh, Streponi in the street and so on and so forth. It became, a, in Catholic Italy, it became a completely different thing. And actually, in the end, more or less isolated her within the household. It was very difficult for her to go out and certainly impossible for her to take part in society. Verdi's anti-establishment liberal mindset naturally drew him towards stories which featured characters that were social outcasts. Take, for example, Violetta in his La Traviata, The Lost One, a Parisian courtesan. It's the first serious opera that's set in the present day. Um, it's the first serious opera in which a soprano dies from a disease rather than uh, dying of joy or from poison or whatever. So it's realistic to its very core. La Traviata was based on a Dumas play, The Lady of the Camellias, about a kept woman who falls in love with a youthful admirer. It was, in Verdi's words, a subject from our own time and resonated personally for him and his lover, Giuseppina. Controversially, he wanted to set La Traviata in contemporary Paris in the 1850s. It would have been immensely shocking had uh, the people in La Fenice arrived and seen in contemporary costume that story. But uh, that was a step too far, I think, for the management of uh, La Fenice. <laughs> The censors did allow the opera to be performed, but like Rigoletto before it, it had to be set in the past. You haven't done the last two times, but when she's thrown against the, the table, just a gasp of shock. In Richard Eyre's production for the Royal Opera House, we've set it in Verdi's day. <laughs> Violetta, the heroine, played by Renee Fleming, knows she's dying of consumption. But against her better judgment, she falls in love with the son of an impoverished country gentleman. Alfredo is played here by Joseph Caleja. One thing he was very attracted to were, were complicated women. So you get a lot of conflicted um, women who change during the course of the plot and so, uh, and so on and so forth. And the most complicated, the most difficult, the most tortured heroine of all is Violetta. In this scene, Alfredo's father, Germain, comes to tell Violetta that she must end her relationship with his son. Alfredo's sister is to be married, and his affair with Violetta threatens the family's name. The heart of the opera is actually is the, the duologue between uh, Violetta and Germain. Once again, Verdi is exploring the father-daughter relationship. Germain may start off as Violetta's accuser, but by the end, he is a consoling father figure. It's a sort of perfect fusion of themes of, of respectability and uh, 
um, loss of reputation and power and vulnerability and fused together in that scene in a quite remarkable way. They're singing and arguing and singing and arguing and suddenly time stops. And just out of nowhere comes this ah in the middle voice that's completely exposed. And in that ah is, uh, you know, a lifetime of pain. I think you should come off before, let the orchestra feel. In rehearsal, Renee and I worked on this very moment. There's a lot of important words, but the killer is the word pura. So I would save giving emphasis on the word bella and save it for pura, because that's what you ain't, and that's what he's been implying all right, along. Right, right, right. And that's very, that's very important, okay? your daughter who's beautiful and pure you know like I'm not thank yeah. you for reminding me that that's so powerful beautiful and pure you know it's, it's just oh. it's, it, and, and by the way that moment is absolutely where the opera turns it's the turning point of the entire piece To Germont's amazement, Violetta agrees to end her affair with Alfredo for the sake of his daughter. He sees that he, this is a wonderful human being, it's a wonderful woman, her love is true, and therefore, ergo, tragic, because he would never back down from his own position that is not possible. It is a, it's a, he, I think rather than being the bad guy, he realizes he's just the, the very dreary, fateful messenger. Mm -hmm. But yet, he would never change his mind. It's not an option. Like Alfredo and Violetta in La Traviata, Verdi and Giuseppina sought refuge in the countryside. They wanted to escape the judgmental eyes of Buceto society they moved to an estate that Verdi had bought nearby, the Villa Sant'Agata. Today it's looked after by a descendant of Verdi's family, Angelo Carrara Verdi. It's a beautiful room. Yes, this is the room of uh, Giuseppina Strepponi. You can see the, the, the room with uh, one bed because uh, in that period uh, they live uh, separate in the house because uh, every, uh, the much part of the day they spend uh, separate in uh, their room. This is uh, Verdi's room. Qui lui, uh, in questa scrivania, uh, componeva. This is the desk where he composed. Look. Wow. I don't believe it. Man. Yes, yes, pregnant. Wow, this is the famous cylinder hat in Boldini's famous painting. I daren't put it on, but I... Wow. 
This is the billiard room. Ah, <laughs> and who came here? Uh, usually they come uh, Boito, Ricordi, Piave, uh, Ghislanzoni. Ah, the librettists. Uh, the librettists. Ah, yes. Because they would have had to stay a few days yes, and to listen to the maestro's instructions, yes. of course, yeah. Because the maestro um, voleva sempre cambiare un po' le parole dei libretti. Uh, he's saying it in a, in a nice way, but um, the uh, Verdi would have uh, uh, liked to make changes in the libretto. Actually, he was extremely demanding. Yes. Politics dominated Verdi's life. He was a passionate Republican and wanted to see his country unified. Italians even seized on his name and used it as a patriotic slogan, Viva Verdi, expressing their secret support for a new king, Vittorio Emanuele, Re d'Italia. Although Verdi was a spiritual man, he was dismayed by the Roman Catholic Church's opposition to unification. He was also fundamentally anti-clerical because of what he saw as the Church's abuse of its power. Nowhere are the conflicting interests of church and state better played out than in his epic Don Carlo, based on a dramatic poem by yet another great writer, Schiller. It's set during the religious wars of the Reformation. The Marquis of Posa, a young visionary, shocked by the oppressive nature of the rule of Spain over the Flemish people, gets an opportunity while he's back in Spain to confront King Philip II of Spain himself and describe to him the horrors that the Flemish people are experiencing. Now, Verdi in, in this music is less interested in form, in, less interested in structure, but more interested in, in, in going with the necessity of the drama Posa, with incredible courage, says to the king, with one word, could make the whole world a happier place by granting libertà, liberty, to the Flemish people. This is followed by a very unusual and new phrase of Verdi's to express this new thinking of the younger generation. music's doing is doing what Verdi often does, which is to express a vivid sympathy for the oppressed and a vivid dismay um, at the forces of tyranny. of King Philip with what Paul has just said, but he calls him a strange dreamer, and now he fragments that new music. drama is now driving the music completely. So now what is recitative and what is m melody or aria is much more fluid. It's much more difficult to tell what's going on really with form. Now the use of chords here, just singular chords in a slow fashion, is something also very, very new. And he exploits this device. The king has heard nothing. Do not be afraid. But, and listen to these evil chords under which he says, Ma ti guarda, but beware of the grand inquisitor.
the Grand Inquisitor is the essence of a kind of negative uh, interdicting church. I mean, it's no accident that he loves this idea of the, uh, the leader of the Catholic Church being blind and old. This idea of the Grand Inquisitor as someone who just powers through unseeing, uncaring of idealism, of youth, just insisting on tradition remorselessly. Verdi's musical characterization of the Grand Inquisitor is one of the most astonishing things he ever wrote. In fact, it's this characterization which is so precise that is a tremendous step forward in his development. Using the cellos and the basses and the contrabassoon in a serpentine melody and groaning trombones. We feel the tremendous weight of the church. Now he describes this man as 90 years old and blind and a symbol of forceful negativity which is the church of that time. His own son. This is something so shocking. And of course, the Inquisitor says to him, gives him justification, says, Well, God sacrificed his only son. In return for granting the king forgiveness for killing his son, the church wants the young idealist, Posa, disposed of. The Grand Inquisitor knows that Posa and the king are very close, but it is these revolutionary, innovative, visionary ideas of Posa that threaten the Grand Inquisitor, threaten the power of the church, threaten the traditions. Posa must go. After the dark and challenging world of Don Carlo, Verdi's next opera would prove to be something very different. This is Verona. 13,000 people come to hear Giuseppe Verdi's music and to watch this great spectacle, which is Aida. It's my first time here too, you know. Aida has come to symbolize the epitome of grand opera. Verona's classic staging has an orchestra of 150 musicians and a cast of 450. Aida was commissioned for the opening of the Cairo Opera House, which was built to commemorate the Suez Canal. The Cairo Opera House obviously wanted to outdo Paris and French Grand Opera as much as possible. So the idea of Maida was clearly to produce something on an enormous scale, which would sort of create shock and awe in the audience. <laughs> The popular success of Aida was enormous. It went on to open in theaters all over Europe and America. But after Aida, Verdi wrote no new operas for the next 15 years. He didn't need to. He was a very rich man. Continuing his interest in Italian politics, in 1875, he became a senator. 
I'm traveling to Milan for the final chapter of this story. The world of opera was changing. In Germany, Richard Wagner's fusion of music and drama in a continuous flow, unbroken by recitativo or aria, may already have influenced Verdi while he was composing Don Carlo. He came to Milan sporadically to oversee productions of his works. You've got to understand that quality at this time was a very much an up and down affair. Verdi's presence would certainly guarantee a certain, shall we say, seriousness of purpose. He was a tyrant. It was during these years that through the machinations of Giulio Ricordi, his publisher, and the talented librettist Arrigo Boito, that Verdi was slowly lured back by the prospect of setting to music Shakespeare's Othello. Verdi's Othello distills what's in Shakespeare. It's, in a sense, a Shakespearean opera, but uh, it kind of um, takes it to uh, a level of intensity and, and expressiveness that is beyond the, the spoken word. <laughs> has taken the operatic world by storm, literally. This is a man in his 70s writing something that had been germinating in him for years and years. And it prompts a musical response for him that is just overwhelming. Listen to Otello's entrance after the storm, having defeated the Ottoman enemy. <laughs> Rejoice! <laughs> That phrase is one of the most glorious entrances in all opera. Believe me, um, all the tenors tremble uh, when they have to deliver this line because it's almost, it's like a visiting card and they're going to be judged from this first phrase by the audience. And it will in some way set the tone for the rest of the opera. Verdi was inspired by Shakespeare's powerful tragedy about a warrior who is tricked by the unscrupulous Iago into believing that his wife, Desdemona, is having an affair. In it, he reaches a new mastery of musical characterization. Verdi never wrote more beautiful music, more music infused with a sense of purity and genuineness than he did for the character of Desdemona. The best way to think about Otello is as a kind of commentary on earlier 19th century opera where you've got, um, you've got Desdemona who is the essence of bel canto, the old Italian tradition. And then you've got on the other side of this Iago who declaims, who only sings beautifully when he's lying, so he's the modern man, he's the one who's trying to destroy everything. His music is incredibly suggestive. Again, the orchestra playing a huge part 
in defining him. He says, I am wicked. I am a man and I feel the mud of my origin in me. Yes, this is my faith. In other words, that which is evil inside him, the possibilities of evil. Listen to this music. Son shall tremendous demon inside this man and but this is him in private when he's among people he's somebody completely different that was heaped upon Giuseppe after the triumph of Otello was something unprecedented. Of course, everyone expected him to enjoy this achievement and die a happy man, but the best was yet to come. In his 80th year, Verdi surprised everyone and produced his 28th opera, Falstaff. Verdi had devoted his entire life to opera. By the time he wrote Falstaff, he was a complete master of his craft, and he used all his technique and genius to produce a comedy, a brilliant one. <laughs> By the time you get to Falstaff, this octogenarian composer who's absolutely his own man, his own artist, is, is smashing all the forms of Italian opera. There are no arias, there are monologues, but nothing has an aria structure. It's a miracle uh, for a composer to, to come to this plane now to embrace comedy. Look at the advice Falstaff gives to his two cohorts, Bardolf and Pistol. If you're going to rob, you have to do it properly. L'arte sta in questa massima. L'arte sta in questa massima. Rubar con garbo e a te. It says, rob with grace and with good rhythm. You're rubbish artists. Falstaff sums up his philosophy of life at the very end of the opera, saying that the whole world is a jest, that we are all born jesters and we are there to taunt and mock, but it's the one who has the last laugh who wins. And Verdi sets this philosophical credo, if you like, to music in the most incredible fugue. Now, fugue is um, a piece of music which starts with a theme and then another voice or another instrumental voice will sing that same theme at a different pitch while the other voice is continuing on 
And the word brlone, which is very hard to say, brr, brlone, um, we're all born jesters, but this adds to the life of the sound. <laughs> And everybody has their voice until it builds up to an incredible pitch, um, fever pitch, in fact. He says, Tu ti gab. Party means we're all mocked. And they have to respond, the rest of them. Of course, his beloved orchestra gets the very last laugh. After Falstaff, Verdi lived on for eight years, but there were no more operas. This is where Verdi died. Quite incredible to be in the same room, actually. You know, the story goes that um, as he was dying, they put straw out on the pavement, on the streets, so that the carriages, the noise of the carriages would, would be diminished so as not to disturb him in his last hours. In February 1901, a month after Verdi's death, 300,000 people thronged the streets of Milan to watch the procession taking his body to its final resting place. A huge chorus sang. Naturally, they sang his great hymn to freedom, Va pensiero from Nabucco. By the end of his life, Verdi had come to symbolize Italy itself. The operatic succession would now pass to a very different genius, Giacomo Puccini. Opera continues with a taste of the food of Italian opera here on BBC4 tomorrow at 9 with Rick Stein. And then on Wednesday, we ask what makes a great tenor, also at 9. There's a little taster of that coming up in just a second. Next tonight, stay with us for brand new Storyville.